Welcome to the Uncanny Magazine podcast, episode 43A. I am Michael Damian Thomas, the co-editor-in-chief and co-publisher of Uncanny Magazine. And I am Lynn M. Thomas, the co-editor-in-chief and co-publisher of Uncanny Magazine. Welcome to Year 8 Space Unicorns! Yes, we are starting with this podcast, the eighth year of existence of the Uncanny Magazine an Uncanny Magazine podcast. So thank you once again, Kickstarter backers who made this possible and the Patreon patrons who always make it possible and our wonderful Amazon Kindle and waitlist book subscribers and everyone who listens to this podcast, reads the magazine, spreads the good word. Thank you all and thank you to the universe's greatest staff. I know this is what we usually say at the end, but heck, this is the beginning of year eight. So let's let's just put it out there in front because without all of you, we don't exist. And we think that Uncanny still is doing some important work. So thank you so much, Space Unicorn Ranger Corps, for making this all possible. We are super excited to bring you lots more really awesome fiction, poetry, nonfiction, podcasts, and art. We're going to art real hard. Woo, it's going to be a fabulous year, Space Unicorns. Around here, it is nearly as we record this Halloween. So Caitlin and I, it's also near Caitlin's birthday, have been watching all the horror movies. Lynn has been trying to avoid watching all the horror movies. As I just hide in another room. Yeah. But it is getting crisp in the air, and it is time to start our news. Tremendous news, Space Unicorns. Metal Like Blood in the Dark by T. Kingfisher, otherwise known as Ursula Vernon, is the 2021 WSFA Small Press Award winner. Congratulations, Ursula, and to all of the finalists. From their website, the award honors the efforts of small press publishers in providing a critical venue for short fiction in the area of speculative fiction. The award showcases the best original short fiction published by small presses in the previous year. An unusual feature of the selection process is that all voting is done with the identity of the author and publisher hidden so that the final choice is based solely on the quality of the story. And the winner is chosen then by the members of the Washington Science Fiction Association. Space Unicorns, are you members of DISCON 3, the upcoming Worldcon in Washington, D.C.? Just your reminder that if you're listening to this before November 19th, 2021, you should get your ballot in and vote for the Hugo Awards. There are some amazing finalists. And of course, as a reminder, Space Unicorns, there are four Uncanny Magazine stories that are finalists for the Hugo Award this year. Burn, or The Episodic Life of Sam Wells as a Super by A.T. Greenblatt is a finalist for Best Novelette. The Inaccessibility of Heaven by Aliette de Bodard is a finalist for Best Novelette. Badass Moms in the Zombie Apocalypse by Ray Carson is a finalist for Best Short Story. And Metal Like Blood in the Dark by T. King Fisher is also a finalist for Best Short Story. Congratulations to everyone. And of course, Uncanny Magazine itself is a finalist for Best semi prose. So make sure you, if you are voting, you know, read read widely, vote for the things you love, and have fun. Uh, Caitlin and I will not be at this World Con, however... I will, and I have my dress all picked out for the Hugo Awards ceremony. I'm a little excited. It's very sparkly. So please come and say hi to Lynn if you see her, if you are there. Yes, I don't have my programming yet, but uh, I plan to be around, and I am thrilled to talk to folks. So please do come up to me and say hello. I'm an extrovert. I welcome human interaction. And that is, once again, the 79th World Science Fiction Convention, December 15th through 19th, 2021, in Washington, D.C., at the Omni Shoreham Hotel. Are you a poet? Here is a reminder that Uncanny Magazine is currently open to poetry submissions. We will be closing the submissions on November 15th at 11.59 p.m. Central. So please get them in. Our poetry editor, Chimedum Ahebu, is super excited to read your poetry, so please don't self-reject. Send in your poems. And now a word from our sponsor. Erewhon Books invites you this January to travel down the mighty Seraphine as two sisters, Celestia and Azara, must repay their debt to a river goddess and find their hidden sibling, Decay, the god of death. Pre-order The Beholden by Cassandra Rose Clark. Hugo and Nebula award-winning Max Gladstone called it a wonderful, creepy quest through a magical, ever-changing wilderness with a world at stake and love in the balance. The Beholden, on sale January 18th, 2022. 
And welcome back. Our story this month is The Stop After the Last Station by A.T. Greenblatt. Our poem, Post-Massacre Psych Evaluation by Abu Bakr Sadiq. And finally, Lynn M. Thomas interviews A.T. Greenblatt. Hey, that's me! So A.T. Greenblatt's The Stop After the Last Station is one of those interesting liminal space stories about travel, identity, and transformation. As always, you know, I think many of you have read many A.T. Greenblatt stories. You know, she has had a few in Uncanny Magazine, as earlier mentioned when we were talking about the Hugo Award finalists. So, and we think this is as good as any of them. So I think you're going to love this story. The Stop After the Last Station by A.T. Greenblatt, as read by Erica Ensign. Tito never believed that the stop after the last subway station existed, the place where the world supposedly changed for the better, the one he needs six silver tokens to get to. Until he does. Until he needs to. That's when he boards the subway and travels on it for two and a half years, hurling forward towards a place that he's only heard of in hushed, fervent stories. Except Tito doesn't truly believe in the stop after the last station until he's standing between where the tracks end and the new world begins, wearing the last of his lipstick, with only two aspirins and one shiny token left in his pocket. The impossibly tall, conductor, tour guide, gatekeeper smiles down at Tito. I can get you in. She croons in his ear. She means past the turnstile at the end of the track, which gleams like silver, but its edges glint like knives. How much? he asks, mouth dry. One token, please. Tito's aching fingers curl around the last coin in his pocket. It's all he has left. His luggage, his memory, himself have all been lost along the way. It's been a long trip. Past the turnstile, he sees a respectable road with bicycles and vespas, a fruit cellar and lingerie shop. He smells the engine exhaust and hears the drift of a radio turned up too loud. The world beyond is alive and full of potential, yes, but to Tito, the promise of this new place doesn't quite cancel out the pang of loneliness and loss in his chest. This isn't what I imagined, he says, proud that he still remembers that bit at least. Isn't it supposed to be better here? The conductor, tour guide, gatekeeper shrugs. For some, it is. She shrugs again and holds out her hand. Well? Tito hesitates. Why? He thinks. Why? Isn't this what you wanted? Isn't this what you traveled two and a half years on this stupid subway for? After all he's given up to get here, this should be an easy sacrifice. A no-brainer. Except, now that he's standing at the end of the tracks, at the cusp of a new home beyond the turnstile, a new future, and he can't imagine himself in it. What if... what if I wanted to go back? he asks. The conductor's gaze is piercing, but there's a hint of a smile on her lips. I'm sure we can work something out, she replies. A few stops ago, when Tito has two coins in his pocket instead of one, he weighs his options. Well, the conductor, repairman, toll collector looms over him, palm outstretched. Will you give up a coin to save what's left of you? This far into the trip, tokens are rare and precious. The subway car was once packed with people. Now it's a bleak and lonely place filled with empty seats and hollow places where memories once were. It's not just the passengers who are disappearing. Tito's last remaining possessions are pooled in his lap. Two tokens, a tube of Parisian red lipstick, some colored pencils, a bottle of aspirin, a photo of himself and a woman he doesn't recognize. She's important, he thinks. So important. But her name is gone, like a distracted thought. That terrifies him. He's clinging to what he can. He applies lipstick daily like religion and tries to ignore how the ache in his joints feel more like a memory. How transparent he's becoming. Literally. The subway's flickering fluorescent lights pass right through him now. Will you give a coin to save what's left? 
The conductor's hand is still outstretched. Tito hesitates, though it was never really a choice, was it? He's traveled this far. Reluctantly, like parting from a dying limb, Tito forfeits his second-to-last token. The conductor smiles. Suddenly, Tito's solid again, opaque. He's a little lighter now, maybe, but no longer threatening to disappear. He exhales and sinks into the worn subway cushions, relieved. He takes stock of what remains, counts the items in his lap, his misshapen fingers with their swollen knuckles and then his stiff toes. His joints throb incessantly again, which is annoying and painful, but also a comforting proof of existence. Only now does he notice on the seat next to him there's this ugly mauve blanket. Straight white hairs are caught in the fibers and it smells like apricots. Tito's hair is black and curly and he smells like too much travel. He understands the blanket belonged to another passenger. Someone important. There's a void in his chest where this person should be and Tito wishes he could remember. So much. There's this lanky boy sitting next to him, with long white hair and thick glasses, wrapped in a mauve blanket. Tito has three tokens in his pocket. Cal, that's his name. Tito remembers. Not everything, but more than before. Or is it less? Time's becoming slippery on the subway. Cal's arguing with the conductor-teacher scheduler. Why aren't we there yet? He asks, and the question is full of longing, desperation. The conductor is silent, but her expression is sad, like a promising pupil who hasn't found the right answer yet. How much longer, then? Cal shivers, pulls his blanket tighter, and Tito notices his fingers are completely translucent. Who knows? The conductor replies with a sigh and moves on. The conductor never gives them straightforward answers, but this time, as they watch her walk down the aisle... Cal's expression is devastating, and Tito has to bite the inside of his cheek to stop from yelling awful things after her. I won't make it, Cal says miserably. Look. He thrusts out his hollow hands under Tito's nose. They're shaking. Tito doesn't know what to say. What can he say to a fading friend? So he puts an arm around Cal instead. The movement feels natural, but also reversed. He inhales the scent of apricots, and, Tito remembers vaguely, it's Cal who is usually wrapping an arm around him in comfort. You'll make it, says Tito, hoping words, like wishes, come true on the subway. No, you're going to make it. You're stubborn. Cal points towards Tito's lap, and in it, he's surprised to find his dog-eared sketchbook. He'd forgotten about this. Maybe... Tito says, blushing, as he flips through page after page of half-drawn buildings, semi-formed ideas. But the foundations are there for eco-high-rises and colorful community centers. Who's going to like these weird houses, though? I do. Tito's blush deepens. He can't remember if anyone's ever told him that before. It feels new. I hope the stop after the last station is full of people like you, Cal, he says. Cal grins. Me too. Tito laughs, but he can't shake the feeling of deja vu, or that if he doesn't do something here and now, Cal's going to disappear. And that is an unbearable thought. So he fishes out one of his remaining coins and pushes it into Cal's hand. His friend's eyes go round with surprise. Just promise me you'll hang on this time, Tito says. Cal clutches the token, his pale eyes brimming with tears and hope promise. Tito can't actually remember what happened to his fourth coin. Not exactly. Maybe he traded it? He probably traded it. Everything is bartered and bargained and shared and swapped on the subway. The car is no longer empty, though it's not full either. Rather, It's been staked out by two dozen or so passengers who are lounging, pacing, laughing, drawing, composing, crying, writing. The subway car has become a swirl of ideas and dreams. At first, Tito watches the others from his seat, not quite confident enough yet to approach the woman who's painting three seats down, 
or the blues singer with bold makeup. Cal, on the other hand, is fearless and charming, even though he remembers less than Tito. He travels up and down the car, wrapped in his silly mauve blanket, talking to everyone. But he always comes back to sit down next to Tito, sometimes with a little more than he left with. I forgot about these, he says when he returns with his own notes, full of stories and cartoons about an albino superhero. Create the hero you want to see in the world, I guess, he says as he flips slowly through the pages, giving his eyes time to focus on each panel, all while wearing a delighted smile. That's how Tito finds the courage to talk to the painter three seats down, awkwardly telling her about his unusual building sketches, explaining that back home he was bullied in school for being a nerdy, arthritic teenager, apologizing as he stumbled over his story, embarrassed for being awkward, far from home, and a little lost. He's stunned when the painter doesn't judge him. Neither does the blues singer when he timidly asked for makeup tips. But they ask why Tito's on the subway. He almost says, I want to live someplace better, someplace that gets me. That's why he came on this journey, isn't it? I want to be more than what people think I am, he says instead, and frowns. His story's changing. No, his reasons are changing. No, he's changing. The subway is definitely changing. Sometimes it's a smelly and standard mass transit vehicle. Sometimes it's a posh retro steam engine. Sometimes it's a fish in a river. The transformations are always sudden, unexpected. Sometimes Tito blinks and the subway is new and bewildering. Sometimes he wakes up, looks around, and the sense of deja vu is so strong. Tito thinks he's going to be sick. Once, he tugs on the conductor-engineer-fisherman's sleeve when she walks down the aisle. Haven't I been here before? He asks, more desperate than he means to sound. Yes. Her expression stern almost says, haven't you figured out that time flows back and forth on the track? Okay, so are we heading towards the stop after the last station? Tito asks. Or away from it? The conductor gives him a long, piercing stare. Then she breaks into an unexpected grin. Yes, she says, and walks away, leaving Tito more confused than before. This stretch of the trip lasts for months. Years. Time blurs and bleeds together. Tito learns to barter and trade, to apply eyeshadow and mascara while wearing his finger splints. He remembers why he started putting on lipstick. He figured if people are going to stare at him, he might as well give them something beautiful to ogle at. Now he's perfected the art. He spends hours arguing and laughing and dreaming with Cal as the building designs in his sketchbook become wilder, louder, bolder. In quieter moments, Cal talks about his family, who he left behind so he could learn to tell stories. I just wanted to find an art teacher who doesn't dismiss comics, and a literature teacher who doesn't think graphic novels are for kids, he says. Shouldn't be that hard, right? Tito nods in sympathy. I'm lucky, though. My family gets why I needed to leave, he says lightly. But tears well up and pool behind his glasses. Tito wraps an arm around his friend. How about you? Cal asks. Did your family mind you leaving? Tito frowns. I don't think so. But he touches the picture in his pocket. The truth is, he can't remember who he left behind. They travel, forwards, or backwards, but always together. Tito gets good at talking Cal out of his creative despair, and Cal helps sketch in small details, especially when Tito's tired and every joint in his body is complaining. Except sometimes he has an arthritic flare-up so bad he can't even hold a pencil. When this happens, the conductor medic lifesaver always comes by with ice packs and ointment that smells like nutmeg. She refuses any and all payment for this. Medical necessities should always be free, she says, like it's the most obvious fact. For the first time, Tito realizes the conductor is a friend, too, that she's been one all along. I want to be like you, he tells her. At that moment, in this shifting, changing subway, he can imagine no better life, becoming anything, everything he wants. Her eyes soften. No, you don't, she replies. You're you. You just don't know it yet. Tito recoils, stunned, hurt. Hey, Cal says, protesting on Tito's behalf. 
The conductor turns to Cal. Your stop's coming up, she tells him. What? Cal asks, confused. What? She says. She blinks hard, once, and suddenly the subway becomes a space shuttle, and there are stars outside the window glittering like jewels. The conductor's uniform balloons into an astronaut suit, and she gives them a small wave before leaving Cal and Tito shocked and floating weightless above their seats. They look at each other, stunned, then burst out laughing. Later, when gravity returns and Cal's fast asleep on the seat beside him, Tito studies the picture in his pocket for the millionth time. He can almost remember who the woman is. Her name is just out of reach. Maybe the conductor's right. He doesn't want to be everyone. Anyone. He just wants to find a place where he can be his own weird, stiff-jointed, colorful self. No, he wants to find a place with people like the painter, the blues singer, the conductor, and Cal, without being in a liminal space. No, actually, he wants to stop giving up pieces of himself to get there. Five coins. Tito gives away the first one so easily. He trades his fifth coin for advice, which seems silly in hindsight because the subway is crammed with people now, talking, arguing, smelling of filtered coffee, dishing out wayward guidance for free. Sometimes Tito catches the other passengers staring at him, but for once it doesn't bother him. He gives them a warm smile. Sometimes they smile back. The conductor, mentor, timekeeper is sitting on the seat next to him. Can you tell me how to reach the stop after the last station? He asks, handing the coin over. Is that what you really want to ask me? She asks, taking it with a sidelong look. Tito hesitates. Why do you do this job? He asks. She raises an eyebrow, surprised, which surprises Tito because he didn't think the conductor could be surprised. Because I'm good at it. Also, the subway helps a lot more people than it loses. She pulls her cap down lower. Ask me one more. Make it good. He fiddles with the tube of lipstick. It's Parisian red and nearly full, waiting with promise. What will I find at the end of this trip? He asks, unable to meet her eyes. The conductor breaks into a grin. That's the right question. You're not helpful, he says, groaning, pulling his head in his hands. In hindsight, he should have used that fifth coin to bargain for extra pens, pencil sharpeners, or the foresight to know that he shouldn't disappear just because he doesn't quite mesh with everyone else. Yes, I am, the conductor says. Here. Sit here. Tito looks up, and there's Cal. His white hair is mussed, his thick glasses are slightly askew, and that ridiculous mauve blanket is slung over his shoulder. Hi, I'm Cal, he says. Tito sags with relief. I was wondering where you went, he says. Cal frowns, puzzled. Really? Because I just got on, and that's the only seat not taken, he says, pointing to the space beside Tito. It's true. The subway's brimming with passengers again, all looking for change. Oh, I'm Tito, he slides over and Cal plops down next to him. Hey, I never asked, why do you always have that blanket with you? That's a weird first question, Cal blushes slightly. Don't laugh, okay, but it's what I used as a superhero cape when I was a kid. He hunches slightly, as if bracing for ridicule. Cool, Tito says, nodding. What about now? Cal blinks in surprise. Now I'm just always cold, he replies with a boyish smirk, and Tito laughs. Think there's really a stop after the last station? Tito asks. There better be. I paid a lot for my six tokens. Tito bites his lip, hesitates, then asks anyway. But what if there isn't? Or it isn't right for us? Cal grins mischievously. Well, then I'm getting a refund and coming back. Relief, like he's been holding his breath for years, floods through Tito. He grins back. Yeah, me too, he says, and settles in next to Cal. He has a long trip ahead. No, he's almost there. (laughs) 
On the day Tito exchanges five years of his life and all of his savings for six silver tokens, his mom meets him at the subway. He never believed there was a stop after the last station. Until he did. Until he needed to. He can't remember exactly what sent him to the waitress broker Oracle in the cheap coffee house for the tokens. It wasn't anything original. He remembers that much. Nothing climactic or cunning. But sometimes it's one slur too many, one cruelty too sharp. Sometimes you need to leave to learn. Sometimes you need to come back to become. His mom waits for him at the top of the subway steps, biting her lip. He remembers the tube of red lipstick in his pocket. Hers, the one she handed him when he said he wanted to be someone else, anyone else. His mom was a stage actor turned waitress turned nurse. She understood the power in transformation. She hands him a picture of the two of them. Mom, I'm traveling, not dying. She nods, but the worry's still there. What if you get there? It's not what you want. Tito pulls out the tokens from his pocket. The waitress broker Oracle called them pieces of himself. Five of them are tarnished, used, exchanged and reclaimed. The sixth is untouched. It'll take Tito two and a half years to reach the stop after the last station, to figure out how not to disappear, and two and a half years to return again, to learn how to put together a portfolio of all the buildings he wants to design, how to wear blush and green mascara fearlessly, how to find friends and face the world he knows. What if it's not what you want? His mom asks again. Tito's fingers curl around his last shining token. Then I'll come back and try again. A.T. Greenblatt is a Nebula Award-winning writer and mechanical engineer. She lives in Philadelphia, where she's known to frequently subject her friends to various cooking and homebrewing experiments. Her work has been nominated for a Hugo, Locus, and Sturgeon Award, has been in multiple years' best anthologies, and has appeared in Tor.com, Beneath Ceaseless Skies, Lightspeed, and Clark's World, as well as other fine publications. And now our poem, Post-Massacre Psych Evaluation, by Abu Bakr Sadiq, as read by Matt Peters. I know what I've seen of blood and death, what the night forgets to cover in its shadows, what part of paradise a bullet undresses before the body, before stealing light from its eyes. What was asked is, are you healing or still hurting? I don't know what you're looking for in me. But in my sleep, I keep talking to dead bodies. They speak back with a tongue the government hates, with their mouthfuls of hurt, black holes, dying to swallow the country that tossed their souls to heaven. How much did they pay for your silence? Should the head be cut off from the body, out of fear of what this city of smoke and blood has to tell it? I don't have all the answers. I know nothing of standing for what's right. I'm scared of telling the truth. There are shooters outside my window. Why is the scar on your chin shaped like your country? The dead wish we could hear what they say. I can no longer speak of my needs on the street. How do you translate this kind of silence? There's a lot I cannot tell you. Nobody knows the price of silence. But all my friends are traumatized or waiting for the sun to name a part of them dwindling into oblivion. I watched the police hose down the face of a man with bullets. I watched the man fall like a dry leaf in autumn. I watched the ground catch his blood like raindrops. I watched his body slip into stillness, into God's silence, into my sleep, into my dreams. I look up to the sky to watch God watching us in silence. My sisters are afraid another man will be shot for walking with his head up. I'm afraid I'll be buried without my voice. My voice. My voice. 
Did anyone hear my voice ask the government to end police brutality? My God, my God, please do something before they come for me. Abu Bakr Sadiq, Deadliner 11, is a Nigerian poet. His poems have appeared in Faya, Uncanny Magazine, The Lit Quarterly, Knight's Library Magazine, Iskanchi Press and Magazine, Black Cat Magazine, Zone 3 Press, Rockvale Review, The Drinking Gourd, and elsewhere. He emerged first runner-up in the Whispering Crescent Poetry Prize 2021. He writes from Minna. And welcome back, Space Unicorns. It is me, Lynn M. Thomas, your co-editor-in-chief and co-publisher here at Uncanny Magazine. And I am thrilled to be joined today by A.T. Greenblatt, the author of this month's podcast story, The Stop After the Last Station. Aliza, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. We are thrilled to have you here. And we loved this story so much. We said, let's publish it, which, of course, is how we always want these things to go. (laughs) Uh, Can you tell us a little bit about the genesis of this story? Yeah, sure. Um, So I actually started the story back in 2017. Um, If you've ever, like, heard me talk about my stories before um, or anything, uh, you probably won't be surprised that the Many of them usually take me years to get right. And this one was kind of no exception. I, I basically started telling the story. I want to tell a story backwards because I'm always interested in exploring different types of structures, mm-hmm. story structures and stuff like that. So I was like, what if I tell a story backwards, but it's on a train and the train is liminal? Mm-hmm. Um, so I do that, but I try to do that in a flash form. It just, it didn't hold water. Um, it's funny because I went back and read the story before this today, and uh, it still has the same structure with, like, the coins mm-hmm. and Tito and the conductor and Cal. And all the, it hits the main points. It's totally flat. And mm-hmm. this is all the magic. And, um, yeah, it took me a while. I think I revised the story a couple times, 2017, 2018, mm-hmm. got frustrated, gave up, um, stuck in the door. And then the summer of 2020, I was, uh, had a story due for a critique group, and the story I was writing wasn't coming together. Mm-hmm. It was due in like two days. So I went, oh, crap. Let me see what I have in my old drawers. And I pulled this out. Uh, Revised it, didn't like it, uh, but sent it in to my critique group, and I was like, I, I think everything about this is going to change. I think I want to like make it a murder mystery and have it like this weird little space where the story's going backwards and forwards and characters trying to just solve a mystery while it's all happening. Mm-hmm. And I went, don't change it. We like it the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> so. They they convinced me to kind of keep it as as it was. But my my friend unlocked something for me. Uh, they said uh, it's not a story about Tito changing. It's about him fitting where he came from, mm-hmm. where, uh, rather his home fitting around him. Right. So and that kind of just clicked for the story mm-hmm. for me. So uh, and yeah, I think after that I revised it one more time. If you if you can't tell, I, I revise a lot mm-hmm. and then sent it to you guys. So when you do your revisions, is it is it a straightforward process where you're sort of, you know, you, you wait a period of time until your brain doesn't recognize it as things you just did. And then you're like, who wrote this crap and you rewrite things? Or do you look for specific aspects you wish to revise? Uh, it depends on the story. It depends on my mood. It depends on the deadline. Mm-hmm. Um, my older stories, my imagination and kind of exceed my ability sure mm-hmm. to write and this is was definitely one of those cases mm-hmm. so I had to stick in the door for a while and come back to it when I leveled up mm-hmm. um for other stories I sometimes can go back to them right away after a critique mm-hmm. group meeting within like a few days or something um especially when it's getting closer to the end mm-hmm. some stories I need to wait a few months between revisions to, just to 
kind of have a clean palette as you were mm -hmm. and uh come back with it for fresh eyes so it really depends on the story and then i and then i have all these examples of stories that take me forever but then i've been able to especially recently write stories fairly quickly mm -hmm. with the same level of complexity which mm -hmm has been really exciting for me as a writer. I can imagine. I mean, that's, <laughs> that, when your typical experience is, boy, these things take a while, being able to have something come out faster has got to be exciting. Yeah, and like, just to know that like a couple of years ago, I, I wouldn't have, be able, have been able to tell a story of this type of complexity so quickly. Mm -hmm. was, um, it made me really happy when I was able to do it. Sure. Um, well, and this is a story about Tito leveling up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I, I think maybe we, we both had to level up to, mm -hmm. to figure it out. So Tito's whole journey is about him sort of becoming more himself, right? Like it's uh, the, the, the train is a liminal space that allows for that. Right. It allows for him to begin to sort of put together and codify getting his outside to kind of match his internal vision of himself. You know, and it's, of course, a train just like any kind of travel. It's it's one big shifting context. Mm -hmm. So how do you think that travel gives us a sense of transformation? Do you feel like you've transformed every time you take a trip? Um, <laughs> I definitely not every time, um, but I, I definitely, I think you do transform when you travel, especially uh, the first time. I, I feel like the biggest, some of the biggest changes for me were when it, from traveling was like the first time I was traveling alone mm -hmm. in a foreign country where I didn't speak the language and um, it's scary and nerve wracking and exciting and it makes you wake up and pay attention to things. It makes you try to figure out. It's like problem solving. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I I really love traveling because it makes you realize how big the world is and how strange it is and how mm -hmm. many different ways of being. And I love to do it in real life. Um, I love reading stories about it mm -hmm. because it's a, both about what you, in both cases, traveling in real life and and stories is about what you can be mm -hmm. and you don't have to stay that way if you don't like it right, right. so uh, that first trip I took when I was uh, like 22 mm -hmm. just after I graduated college it really taught me taught me how to like just talk to strangers mm -hmm. <laughs> something I had no no comfort in doing it I was like so painfully awkward mm -hmm. but I realized I would never see these people again mm -hmm. and Somehow that took all the social anxiety away from it. Sure. It made me think a lot about the, it, I did a junior year abroad exchange in college, and it was a very similar experience where everything is awkward and you don't know half of what's going on and you have to figure out how to rely on yourself. Yeah. And also be comfortable going up to people and just like <laughs> asking, asking for, for directions. directions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very apologetically sometimes. And, yep. <laughs> <laughs> and and you may or may not understand those directions once they're given, which is the other half of it. <laughs> right. I mean, it's like one of those things where I realize, like, if I have a really awkward conversational experience, it mm -hmm. doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I've always loved traveling journey stories, too, because it's it's, it's two parts, like... A, it's going on an adventure with someone else. Mm -hmm. the, you know, the protagonist is the vehicle, but the reader is along for the ride. Mm -hmm. And the whole point of going on a journey for a character is to change. Right. And it's fascinating to see how characters change, but don't change sometimes. In this story, I just played with those ideas very literally. So, so were you surprised at how much Tito changed as you revised the story? That, that was one of the biggest things that changed during the revision the, his growth as a character mm -hmm. he went from someone who was kind of stuck in his ways even throughout the journey to someone who was a lot more unsure but a lot more expressive mm -hmm. like the whole bits about the makeup didn't come in until later drafts mm -hmm. the whole uh, aspect of this character having 
uh, juvenile arthritis than come in into later drafts. Mm -hmm. Those character details, the, the things that make him a 3D person, mm -hmm. really gave the story the, the heart it needed. Sure. And of course, one of the other things that happens over the course of the story is that he's he's becoming part of and building a community on the train. I mean, right. He starts off very much alone, and he is not alone. By the end of the story, there's a whole group of people. Even as people disappear, there's still a large group of people that are part of his experience. Yeah, which is which is kind of life, you know. It, it, at least for me, I kind of didn't have any friends when I was a kid, and then you still slowly start to make one and two friends, and then mm -hmm. you you know you, you go to college, you make other friends, you lose touch of your old friends, and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. And people kind of come in and out of your life, and sometimes change you, and sometimes you know, stay with you for a long time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Aliza, so. thank you so much for joining us. Our last question is to ask you to tell us about something that you read or you saw recently that moved you that you would like to share with our listeners. I think last time I was on this podcast, I was telling you how I was catching up on older TV shows. Mm -hmm. Um I'm still doing that. So I <laughs> I may be the last person to have watched Shit's Creek. But You're I, not. Okay. <laughs> I'm two episodes in. You are not the last person. Well, I have to say I really enjoyed it. Um, I recommend it. Mm -hmm. The other one is a novel that uh, I picked up at random and I really enjoyed it. It's called Martha Moody mm -hmm. by Susan St uh, Stinson. Uh, sorry if I messed up her name. But it's uh, published by uh, Small Beer Press and mm -hmm. it's uh, kind of like a old like western but like lesbian love story slash folk tale type thing Ooh, and it was it was delightful i really enjoyed it that does sound delightful and i mean you know i i have yet to pick up anything published by small beer that i haven't absolutely enjoyed so right um, yeah you know the mark of quality to begin with and and you had me at lesbian western so yep <laughs> I, think, I think this would be a absolutely your type of book so excellent I recommend it Awesome. Aliza, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to the Uncanny Magazine podcast. As always, uh, we couldn't do it without the help of all the wonderful, amazing space unicorns out there, as we mentioned at the beginning of this podcast. But one more time, thank you to all of our Kickstarter backers. Thank you to our Patreon patrons. Thank you to our Amazon Kindle subscribers, our Weightless Book subscribers. Thank you to every single person who listens or reads and loves the Uncanny Magazine. But we especially want to thank the universe's greatest staff. That includes our managing editor and poetry editor, Chimedum Ahebu. Our podcast producers, Erica Ensign and Stephen Schapansky. Our podcast readers, Matt Peters and Erica Ensign. Our interviewer, Carolyn M. Yoakum. Our senior assistant editor, Naomi Day. And our assistant editor, Monty Lynn as well as all of the submissions editors who make our work possible. So until next time, shine on, space unicorns. Nay! The Uncanny Magazine podcast theme is courtesy Null Device. Want to join the Space Unicorn Ranger Corps? You can find poetry, stories, and nonfiction every month in Uncanny Magazine. Go to uncannymagazine.com or subscribe to the ebook version at weightlessbooks.com. Uncanny Magazine Podcast, copyright Uncanny Magazine. Mm -hmm.